folks just blow my mind that you're just a giving church, and, and it's wonderful. Anytime we do that, you know, I look at it as that's our mission mission budget, and we're, we're ministering to young ladies all over the three-county area through the Harmony Pregnancy and Resource Center. Now, if you're interested in, in knowing more about that and maybe you'd like to volunteer with the Harmony Pregnancy Resource Center, uh, let me know, and I'll meet you over there one day and introduce you to the director and uh, Fred and a few people that have been there before, and uh, I'd like you to see it. Yes, ma'am. No, I said 1337, yeah. Did I say 300? 13, 13, 1337. 1300, yeah. It might have said, sounded like 300. Might have. But 13, $1,337, that's good. So we'll get it right. We're good. Uh, uh, now, if you want to uh, donate uh, anything to do with baby care needs, we need those over there too because we have a, a store there that the young ladies are able to uh, go there and they take classes, family parenting classes and stuff, and they can earn credits in that store, and they get all kind of really brand new stuff for their babies. So if you'd like to, to donate toward that, they always need diapers and that sort of thing, formula. So uh, it's very special to our heart. How many of you got to see Unplanned? Wow, what a powerful, powerful movie. It blew the lid off of, of Planned Parenthood, that murderous organization that our government even supports. It's pitiful that our government takes hard-earned tax money and supports that wicked organization. Their primary goal is to abort babies. That's their primary goal. That's how they make their money is abortion. And we need to, we need to continually fight that. Uh, tomorrow night, uh, Harmony annual meeting will be at, at uh, 630 over at First Baptist of Archer, or in uh, Newberry, if you can make it. And uh, we would like to, uh, to invite you there. Supper's at, at 630. And uh, right after that, uh, we're going to have a, our annual meeting, and we're going to share uh, things that are happening. You'll put it up there? Okay, sure. Oh, you want to try the other? Okay. You were on the wrong one. Okay. You got it right. Okay, give me just a second here. Let me. Wi-Fi is not available. So I'm good. I'll sit, yep, is it okay if I can preach from down here? I, I like to be able to see the cross, okay? And that's, it's all about Jesus anyway. It's not about us. Amen. Let me see. Give me a second to log into this thing. We were having a little technical difficulty with it this morning, but I think we're we probably got it figured out now. Remote. It's coming up. Uh, but go back to to what we're still not able to connect, Brother Mark. Let's go the other way. Yeah, just go the, 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 I'll switch it with, I got this on, so, okay. Uh, I've got just a second here. There we go. See if it'll click, brother. I got it on here, so make sure my, this is on. Not, not moving. I'll just do like this and you switch it, okay? Go. I do. Yes, sir. <laughs> we'll get it right in a minute. But uh, we, uh, we are highly involved in, in trying to get the, uh, the 20, on the 2020 ballot, we want to get the uh, right to life thing. And is that one ready? Anyway, thank you. Um, the right to life amendment, which will protect the unborn all the way to old people. How many of you are old people? Right now you have no protection. They, they're, they're, they're able to kill babies, and one day they're going to be able to kill you or me. And uh, right now, eagle eggs and turtle eggs and those sort of things have, and manatees have a lot more protection than human beings. Even if Roe versus Wade is overturned in, in America, it would still be legal. Abortion would still be legal in Florida because it's written into our Constitution courtesy of our liberal Supreme Court justices in Florida. So we need to change that, and the only way we can change that is a citizen's initiative to get that on the ballot in uh, 2020. So tomorrow night, Mark uh, Mink will be speaking to our whole association at Harmony and uh, challenging all the other churches. Uh, we're, 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 we were first on the list. I'm glad you guys are cutting edge. But we want to get the word out and get the, you know, get the necessary 
paperwork in place and signatures so we can get it on the ballot. So you pray for that. Critical that we do that this year. Um, I want to speak for the next few minutes from, from John chapter 12, if you want to go there. And uh, this, the name of the, the, the series is Man on a Mission, the fact that Jesus set his face toward Jerusalem. We talked last week about the fact that Jesus knew he was going to die. From the day he was born, when he was cognizant of what was going on, he knew that he was going to die. And uh, as we think about John 12, there are three incidents in Jesus' life on the week before he was killed that happened that were very significant and really marked the end of his public ministry. And you, you recall that he spent a lot of time uh, with his friends in Bethany, you know, with, with uh, Mary, Martha, Lazarus, and their daddy. In uh, John chapter 12, I'll read the scripture, and if you'll read along with me in your scripture, and I'll read it out loud. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany where Lazarus was, which he had, had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, say, why was this ointment not sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, because, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bear what was put therein. Then Jesus said, let her alone against the day of my bearing as she kept this. For the poor always you have with you, but me you have not always. Think about that for a minute. We always are going to have poor people, and we should help poor people, and we do. We have three feeding ministries, and we're going to continue to do that. But it's much more important that we center our worship and our services around Jesus, that especially Easter time, because it's the, it's the most critical part of the Christian calendar. And without Easter and without the resurrection, without Jesus coming back from the dead, we have no real faith. And Paul said, you're, you're a miserable person. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then you're a fool for following him. And brothers and sisters, I firmly believe that Jesus did rise from the grave. And, and, and the, this, this season of the resurrection is so critical. And so let's begin with prayer today. And we're going to look at these three incidents that happened in the life of Jesus on the week before they killed him. Lord, I thank you so much that you put these uh, words in the scripture. And Lord, these incidents happened in your life. And Lord, I pray that we will, uh, as we think about them today, that what you did will be become much more significant in our lives. And Lord, we will, as the, the brothers and sisters did there, Lord, they prepared a supper and they spent time with you. Lord, that we're spending time with you today too. Thank you, Lord, that your Holy Spirit is here. And that uh, you, you, every time we talk about you, Lord, we're remembering, like you, you told us to do, remembering what you did. So help us, Lord, today as we look at these three incidents. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. The first incident was when Jesus was anointed for burial here. Uh, interesting event, and, and you'll see in a moment why is it so interesting, but uh, this arrival is going to set the stage for the crucifixion. Jesus had told the disciples time after time that, that he was going to be killed, and many times they were just kind of, no, 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 that's not going to happen. We're not, you don't need to go to Jerusalem. We're not going to let... He said, guys, wait, what's going to happen? I'm going to Jerusalem. They're going to betray me. They're going to kill me. And I'm going to rise from the dead. But they kept forgetting that and, and kind of pushing it to the back of their minds. And uh, Dr. Luke wrote a sentence that summed up Jesus' complete determination to get Jerusalem. And we looked at that last week in Luke 9.51. It came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up. He steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. See, Jesus was determined. His whole life was a mission. And this man on the mission, he was going to go to Jerusalem. And, and the, the big fear, really, in, in anyone's mind, if you're on a mission, is that you will die before you get to accomplish your mission. And I don't think he really had fear, but there were times when he was uh, threatened. There were times when they were trying to kill him before the, the crucifixion. And each time he evaded their hands and slipped through the crowd and got away because he knew that he was supposed to, to do this in Jerusalem. And, uh, you know, here he visits the home of Simon Lep of the leper. And 
he had been here about a week or so before. Can you remember why he might have been there a week or so before this? John 11 talks about that. What happened? Lazarus was raised from the dead, so it wasn't but a, a week or so before this that Lazarus was raised from the dead. So he had been here before, and they were this the home of Simon the leper with his family. You know, was a, was a normal place that he visited. They were supporters of Jesus, and they were friends of Jesus, and this family loved him and supported him. And his children, Mary, Martha, and the son Lazarus. Now, interesting family, and we're going to see that in a minute. Something interesting that happened earlier in the ministry of Jesus. But how do we know that he went to this place? Well, two other gospels corroborate this. They corroborate the fact that this is where they went and who they were with. So we don't just guess at where he was. And we can't say, well, maybe it wasn't there. No, it was there because the other gospel said it was. And his children, Simon's children, Lazarus, Mary, and Martha, uh, these, this was a special family to him. And you remember the one time when, when Jesus was there and one of them was working and one of them was listening? Remember that? What, did, what, did, what, what was the problem? Remember that? What was the issue? One was complaining, you know, she, she, she's making me do all the dishes and fix the food. And, and what did Jesus tell him? He says, you let her alone. You know, she's, she's listening. Maybe, you know, maybe we ought to take a note from that. Sometimes we worry too much about the, the eating and the, the preparation for that than we do about consuming the Word of God and hearing what Jesus had to say. But here, Jesus is anointed uh, by Mary. And this is incident number one. But it's interesting that this is... This is uh, a similarity between something that happened earlier in the ministry of Jesus. Go to Luke chapter seven, or yeah, Luke chapter seven, just for a minute, and let's look at that together. Luke chapter seven, and I want you to—I'm going to read it, and I want you to be thinking about it as I read it. And we're going to start with verse thirty-six. Luke chapter seven. Now one of the Pharisees was requesting him to dine with him, and he entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And there was a woman in the city who was a sinner. And when she learned that he was reclining at the table at the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster vial of perfume. Standing behind him at his, at his feet, weeping, she began to, to wet his feet with her tears and kept wiping them with, with the hair of her head and kissing his feet and anointing them with perfume. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would, have, he would know who and what sort of person this woman is who is touching him, and she's a sinner. Jesus answered said, Simon, I have something to say to you. He said, say it, teacher. A certain money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50, and they were unable to repay. He gracious, when, when they were unable to repay, he graciously forgave them both, which of them will love him more. And Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, you've judged correctly. Turning to the woman, he said to Simon, you see this woman? I entered your house. She gave me no water for my feet. And she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but she, since the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with perfume. For this reason, I say to you, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, Your sins have been forgiven. And those who were reclining at the table with him began to say to themselves, Who is this man who forgives sin, or even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Now, think about this. Is this the same family, maybe? Think about it. See, after after Jesus in Jesus' ministry, they were they ministered and supported him. And when he would go to Bethany, he would go there. Similarity could be the same woman. Maybe, well, look at it this way. You know anything about Pharisees? What do Pharisees do to people that have been caught in sin? They would bring them before the magistrate. Now, why would he allow this person in his house? and not stone her if he wasn't kin to her. So might possibly be the Mary, <laughs> the Mary Martha and Lazarus. Anyway, 
what you believe about that won't determine your salvation, but I found it very interesting that two times he's anointed with perfume, and, and both times, one time at the house of Simon in John 12, and here he calls the Pharisee that, has, that was in his house, Simon, you know, so maybe the same person. I find it very interesting. Uh, that, but this incident, he was anointed. This was early in the ministry. He's anointed. Now he's anointed again right before the crucifixion. And he says, you leave her alone because she's anointing me for my burial. Isn't that cool? That Jesus knew. He knew where he was going. He was a man on a mission. He knew what was happening. See, that was incident number one. Now, incident number two is when Jesus enters Jerusalem. And we call that Palm Sunday. And that will be coming up. Uh, the 14th this year Easter's been pushed back a, a week or so but it'll be coming the 14th and we'll have a, a cool little thing happening with our kids right our, our A's and G's are going to do something really cool on that day but Jesus enters this very town where the religious leaders are planning on killing him and he, when he enters he's riding on a young donkey he enters to the sound of praises and pra people are praising God and throwing their clothes down and and making a big deal and calling him the king, the king has arrived and uh, it's interesting and they're, they're singing to him Hosanna and Hosanna means save us now isn't that interesting they're talking to the king and saying save us now a lot of them didn't even know they needed saving and most people today don't know they need saving you know people it's hard to get a person saved when they can't you can't get them lost they think well I'm a good person well listen the whole world needs salvation and that's why Jesus came. He was a man on a mission, and he was bringing salvation uh, to the world. And uh, Zechariah 9, 9 says this. It's a, it, this was a fulfillment of prophecy. Uh, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass and upon the colt, the foal of an ass. Isn't that neat? Jesus is fulfilling Old Testament prophecy. And here these people don't even know it. They're fulfilling the prophecy. And they're singing to Jesus. And, and he accepts this role as king and savior. And uh, in, in the crowd singing from, from uh, Psalms 118, that's if you want to find out where this came from, it comes from Psalms 118. And Psalms 118, when a, when a new king would ride in Jerusalem, they would usher him in to the sound of this very same thing, riding on a donkey. They would go to the temple and offer sacrifices and little did they know that the, the supreme sacrifice of all the ages was riding into Jerusalem and this incident is so critical and so important to the whole world that Jesus, the Prince of Heaven, is riding into Jerusalem for the very last time really because by the end of the week they're going to they're gonna put him on the cross and see they think he's come to set up the kingdom Welcome, welcoming the king they're singing Psalms 118 and, and they're wanting a new king because they're under what kind of oppression right then? Who was ruling the world? The Romans, and they were cruel, harsh. You know, uh, if you were a Roman citizen, you had a lot of rights, but if you weren't a Roman citizen, you were, you were a subject and really a slave to the Roman Empire. And they were hoping that Jesus was riding into Jerusalem at this point to deliver them. And he's heralded as, as the new king, and they, they bring him in on, the, on the, the donkey. But they didn't realize that by the end of the week that he would, he would be the sacrifice they wouldn't offer lambs or or you know the, the bulls or anything for sacrifice but jesus himself would be the sacrifice uh, you see he came prepared to die if you'll go back in 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 john 12 there again look at john 12 verse 23 and following so jesus answered and said to them the hour has come for the son of man to be glorified and truly truly I say to you unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies it remains by itself alone and if it dies it bears much fruit think about that Jesus he knew where he was going they didn't catch his death didn't catch him by surprise because he knew he was a man on a mission he knew what was coming and, and he told them ahead of time uh, that in verse 12 that his in Matthew chapter 26 verse 12 for in that she has poured this ointment on my body. She did it for my burial. See, Jesus knew why he was there. It, it's, a lot of people think, well, they just they caught him off guard and they overpowered the disciples. And they, no, Jesus voluntarily rode into Jerusalem knowing what was going to happen by the end of the week. And by the end of the week, the tide of public opinion had changed. 
all those people that were laying palm branches down and praising him, most of those had, had run away. And those that were left kept their mouths shut as the crowd would say, Crucify him! Crucify him! The very one they had heralded as king early in the week when this incident number two happened as he rode in to Jerusalem. And third incident, this interesting incident happening there in, in John 12, verses 20 and through 23, it says, Now there were certain Greeks among those who were going up to worship at the feast. These therefore came to Philip, who, had, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and began to ask him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. And Philip came and told Andrew, and Andrew Philip came and told Jesus. And Jesus answered, saying, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Boy, aren't you glad that, that the people from the West came looking for Jesus? Think about this for a minute. The Greeks had ruled the world before the Romans, and the Greek language was everywhere around the world. Everybody spoke, spoke uh, street Greek, Koine Greek. They called it street Greek. Everybody spoke it. The whole world of that particular time, the, the civilized world spoke that language, and, and the very ones from Greece come looking for Jesus. And Jesus, of course, meets them at that incident. And Isaiah chapter 11, verse 10 says, In that day there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign of the people. To it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. <laughs> As Paul Harvey said, the rest of the story. Do you know why the West has been so powerful and, and has been so, so totally different than the East and the uh, Arabian nations and those that didn't receive Christ and, and the, the Chinese that didn't receive Christ at that particular time? And the message went to the West. Did you know you're a, you're a Christian right here, right now, because these Greeks came looking for Jesus? Did you realize that? Because it spread all through Asia Minor and all through Greece and all up through Europe and eventually to England and the, and the uh, Scottish Isles and, and then to America I mean, when the pilgrims came and you're a direct result of these Greeks coming and looking for Jesus on that particular day right before he went to the cross and I find it interesting uh, Jesus said that if I be lifted up you know I'll draw people to me see these foreigners come, come looking for Jesus and Jesus said hey when I'm lifted up, you know, I'm going to draw all men unto me. And that, bring, that gives a lot of significance to John 3, 16, doesn't it? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Interesting. Jesus met with these Greeks, this third incident, you know, and the fact that he loved the world then. And he loves the world today. He loves lost sinners and he wants them to come to him. People think God's bad at me. He wants me to go to hell. No, he doesn't. <laughs> he wants you to live. He wants you to live in heaven with him forever. People think, well, he's mad at me. He's, he's, he's messing my life. No, he's not. No, he's not. The reason your life's messed up is you messed it up. Okay? You messed it up. Your choices messed your life up. And so many times we blame that on God. But see, God loves us. You know, He did then and he does today. And the Greeks and many more from the West were ready to hear about God's saving plan. All those letters written to the Corinthians, the Galatians, and the Ephesians, that's up around the Greek Isles, you know, Corinth, in Greece, you know, uh, the Romans, Italy, all that whole area was ready for the gospel. It was ripe. And then the gospel spread to the Americas. See, a lot of people think today, well, the white privilege. I don't believe that. I believe it was Christian privilege, yeah, because we had the message. But you know what we did in turn with the message? We sent missionaries back across the world. And now the gospel is growing every day. There are more Christians alive right now and more people coming to the kingdom of God right now than any time in history. You see a lot of churches closing in America and in, in England they're pretty much gone. But see, it started with us. It started with the Greeks. It spread to the Americas and we had great revivals and millions of people got saved and we sent missionaries back and now it's exploding and now the center of the Christian universe is in deepest heart of Africa and in, in Asia. Isn't that crazy? It's spreading back and exploding where it came from. And, and Jesus said, if I be lifted up, you know, I will draw all men to me. See, the Bible says God didn't send His, world and, His Son into the world to condemn the world, but 
that the world through him was it saved, might be saved. Boy, I tell you what, I find it very interesting. These three incidents that happen the week before he's murdered, you know, it's, it's just setting the stage for the, the, the most wonderful, the most terrible thing that happened in history when they killed the Savior. <laughs> but really the most wonderful thing because God set it up. And Jesus said, I come to die for the sins of the world. And in fact, look, look at uh, in, in over in, uh, you might not have ever read this, but go to Hebrews 10 just for a minute. Listen to, this is cool. Maybe you've never read this before. Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 10. Starting with verse 1. For the law, since it was only a shadow of the good things to come and not, very, not the very form of things, can never by the same sacrifice year by year, which they offer continually, make perfect those who draw near. Now, think about this for a minute. You got a lot of people that say they're going to get into, the, get into heaven because they, te- they keep the law. They keep the Ten Commandments, right? There are people that still do that today. It says those which do this can't, this is by year, which they offer continually, make perfect. It cannot make people perfect. Well, number one, think about this. Where are they offering sacrifices today? Other than a few obscure places in Israel, some of the real strict Jews that are up in the mountains might be. Who else is offering blood sacrifices for sin? You know of anybody? The people that want to keep the law and get into heaven like that, they, see, they haven't, been, they haven't been offering the blood sacrifices all these years. So they're missing it. They're missing the point. Look at verse 2. Otherwise... Would they not have ceased to be offered because the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have been conscious of sins, have consciousness of sin? But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins year by year. It had to be continually done. Every year, they had to offer the, the, you know, the scapegoat and, the, and blood sacrifice year in and year out, and over and over again. More blood, more sacrifices. Verse 4, For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, he comes into the world. When he comes into the world, who's he talking about? He. Jesus. When he comes into the world, he says, Sacrifice and offerings thou hast not, not desired, but a body thou hast prepared for me. You see, he knew, what he, he knew why he came. He knew why he was a human. He said, A body you prepared for me. In whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast no pleasure. Verse 7, Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the roll of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. (laughs) Jesus was a man on a mission. He knew why he came. He came to die. He came to be the sacrifice. Verse 8, After saying above, Sacrifices and offerings and whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast not desired, nor hast thou taken pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do thy will. You see, he takes away the first in order to establish the second. By this we will have been sanctified to the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Would you say hallelujah? (laughs) Isn't that wonderful to know we don't have to keep offering goats and bulls and sacrifices. Our Savior came and offered his own body on the cross. And in this last week of his life, these three incidents set this up and, and kind of set the stage. Jesus came to die. And he, and he said in uh, the scripture, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men to me. Now, Jesus, Jesus preaches his last sermon to the Jews and uh, he talks about the fact that they're going to be blinded. A lot of them will be blinded for a long time. And a whole generation after generation after generation of Jews were blinded. They didn't, they didn't receive it. Only a few. Now, remember this. All the early disciples, what were they? Were they Gentiles or Jews? Jews. All the early church before Pentecost, what were they? Jews. So a lot of Jews got saved, but the, but the nation as a whole was blinded. They didn't accept Messiah. But Jesus said they're blinded for a while. And, and he brought people like us into his great family. Aren't you glad that God brought you in to his great family. Aren't you glad that Jesus offered his sacrifice for you? Well, I'm thankful. And I know you should, you are and should be. Now, as we conclude today, uh, go back and read John 12. It's just an awesome, awesome book. There's so many, so many truths there that we don't have time to cover 
in a, in a short uh, time like this. But I love John 12. That's one of my favorite parts of the gospel. And uh, I know as you read it and as you think about these three incidents, you'll, you'll love it more as well. And I have a fresh appreciation for, for uh, Simon and Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, don't you? And also I know there were Southerners. How do you know there were Southerners? They made him a supper. Amen? <laughs> you have breakfast, dinner, and supper. Amen. Love you guys. Thank you for coming today. Let's close in prayer. And we're going to have a, a short invitation. And we have some folks that want, to, want you to meet. They want to be, become a member of our church. And we're going to let you meet them today. And then uh, come down and give them a hug afterwards. So let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for these three incidents this last week of your life, Lord, and uh, that set up the, the crucifixion, Lord. And really, uh, we know, Lord, by reading this, you weren't shook up, you weren't scared. <laughs> you were ready for it because you knew what you were going to accomplish. And you said, I come to do my Father's will. Thank you so much that you did because we would never have been in the family of God had you not done those things. So thank you, Jesus, once again. And in your sweet name I pray. And all God's people see. Amen. Let's all stand.